Welcome to Town Meeting Television, um, home of community media. I am here with the Gadfly Collective, or members of the Gadfly Collective. Yay! Yay. So excited to have you here. Um, let's let's have just a quick go around. Maybe tell me your name and um, a little bit about how you got involved in the Gadfly. How did you find each other? All right. And. I'll well, yeah. first, I mean, people don't know what the gadfly is. So tell yeah. us, what is the gadfly? Oh, oh, that. The <laughs> gadfly is a leftist alternative student newspaper on campus that we just reintroduced um, after a long hiatus. Um, it was originally started in 85 and went up till 97. And I discovered it last spring, last January, I think. Um, accidentally, a librarian told me about it and um, the rest is history. <laughs> so your name is Perva, yes. right? And you, um, you ran in, you came into special collections and started perusing old issues of the gadfly. And what stood out to you? What made you excited about it? Um, it was definitely different from what did exist on campus um, then, which was and still continues to be the cynic. Um, I specifically, well, I went there because I had just found out about the cakewalk and I was like, whoa, um, no one really talks about this. I wonder what the cynic has to say. Um, not, not a lot of nice things, I'd say. Um, and I was taken aback and shocked and um, I was going through it and like, I guess um, a librarian um, saw me and was like, have you heard of the gadfly? And I was like, no, um, what is it? And he brought me the little folder and I went through it and um, I was immediately in love and I really liked how they covered issues on campus that either differently or that were just not in the cynic. And I enjoyed their writing style and it was, I mean, alternative in the end. And I, yeah, it was, and especially related to campus activism, like I could definitely see that the members were involved um, in their community. And I, as someone who is involved in my community, I could almost relate to them and their, I guess, experiences almost, because a lot of us have gone through the same things or are continuing the same struggles. Great. How did you find the Gadfly, and how, what's your involvement in this? Uh, so I'm Katie, and I founded, and or refounded, as we found out, uh, and I run the Disabled Students Union on campus with Kira Malone and Lily Olson. Um, and I came to a meeting with these guys just to kind of meet everyone, and they were talking about starting up the Gadfly, and I was like, what? <laughs> what's a Gadfly? Um, and yeah, I got pretty much the explanation Porva gave, and it sounded really interesting. I liked that there was a new alternative voice kind of starting up on, or restarting on campus. Um, and then just stuck around ever since. Um, and they've been really helpful with the union, we've been helpful with them, and it's nice to be part of both organizations. What do you, what's the Disabled Student Union hope to affect on, what kind of changes do you hope to make on the campus? Um, so we're aiming to provide a kind of a combination of like a social and community space and also an activism space. Um, so people can kind of use, they can get out of it what they need to. Some people come to us just saying, hey, I feel very isolated. I don't really know what to do. Um, and they can use this for that. Some people are saying, hey, I want to get involved with disability activism. Where do I start? Um, so we're a little bit of a catch all, um, but we exist to kind of hold the university accountable, to hold student accessibility services accountable, uh, and to make sure that disabled students have a space for us because there wasn't one before. Yeah, so some of you have seen at local community act events, city council meetings, Aspen, tell us a little bit about your involvement in Gadfly and how you come to be involved in community politics. Yeah, so I got involved with uh, kind of our parent, I guess parent organization, UVM Union of Students, uh, back when I first came on campus in September, I think, 2021. And I, and I was just immediately, I just was immediately hooked from, I believe it was an action about Sodexo and how our current dining provider, who's been there for 60 years, has a real sweetheart deal and it's not a great company and the way they treat the workers is really, is just not great. And yeah, I was hooked in, hooked in by that. And since then, I've kind of fallen down the rabbit hole with uh, the Sears Lane 
encampment and the defense of that, which is such a current issue as well. And and I just kind of went from there. The uh, Sears Lane really got me involved as well as the current issues with uh, Ali House's election and subsequ subsequently the fight for police accountability with uh, Proposition 7 and 8 that unfortunately failed uh, last this most recent March. Yeah, and that's how I've been involved and yeah. And Mac, you're wearing Will Miller Social Justice Lecture Series t-shirt. Yeah. And Will Miller was one of the uh, mentors to many of the folks who worked on the Gadfly. You want to talk a little bit about how you got involved? And uh, Sure. Um, I arrived on campus during like the peak of COVID. So we were all pretty separated and I didn't really know what was going on and I had been involved with some like youth climate activism when I was younger and then uh, showed up here you know had a bad first semester and then the beginning of the following year I still didn't know that many people and so I was walking around campus and I saw a poster for an event called Community Fest which is something that was thrown by the uh, UVM mutual aid group that was around at the time and they were doing mutual aid work and connecting the local community to campus organizations and just generally doing whatever they felt like doing. And I thought it looked cool and I got involved with them, involved with the local Food Not Cops group and a couple other groups around town. And then later that semester, Sears Lane uh, became a thing, where, or not became a thing, but caught the attention of everyone around town. and hung out there, supported where I could, and then just got pretty heavily involved with the mutual aid work on campus. And then we were doing an, like a support action for the staff union last year when Porva brought up to us that she had been reading a bunch of old Gadfly articles. And we were like, what, what's the Gadfly? And she was like, let me tell you. And she pulled up uh, her computer and just had like, a ton of gadfly articles that she had saved and we were like oh this is so cool we should do something like that and we were like how would we do it we spent all this time figuring it out and then we've spent the past year figuring out how to start our own little student newspaper and yeah awesome um, I'm Sam uh, it's my like first here uh, first year here at UVM so I, I don't have too much under my belt yet um, but I got introduced uh, this September um, to the Union of Students um, and from there we did a lot of different things um, but like la about last semester um, we started getting serious about wanting to start writing articles and, and getting everything together to publish the Gadfly um, and I've, I've been working um, the entire time just trying to put stuff out and I'm, I'm happy where we're, with where we're at right now. So I, I talked to a former Gad, you all got to meet some former Gadfly heads or Gad heads, as we're calling them, <laughs> Gadflyans. And one of, I, I talked to somebody, said, I'm going to meet with a group of students who are restarting the Gadfly, and what would you ask them? And he said, ask them how they came to be enamored with the idea of altering human suffering that is alterable. And so I wonder if you can dig down, because you've come together in community, and I think one of the things that you heard from one of the former Gadfly folks was, if all you do is take away from this experience your own growth and your own growth in community with each other, just value how precious that is. How did you feel like you came to this idea that you could make a change in the world to alter suffering that can be altered? It's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> a big question. Um, question. I would say it's harder to believe that it's impossible to change mm -hmm. that because all of this, there's so much amazing stuff that humans can do, like so much beautiful art, so much capacity for love and kindness, and so much capacity for thought and insight and beauty. And the idea that like this is it and this is the best the world can get, I don't think any of us can accept that. Mm -hmm. When we look around and we see just how rough it is, it's harder to accept that's impossible to change it for me. Yeah, that was definitely my mindset um, going into the Fly Collective and also um, just campus activism in general. Like, 
I, it was hard for me to stay silent or to pretend like all this stuff wasn't going on. And I've like definitely been that way since the beginning, but I think um, going into college when you have much more freedom of expression and you're not, I mean, there are less consequences, well, there definitely are consequences and we are dealing with them, but um, you have, you, you do have the ability to speak up and talk about the things that do matter. Um, I think it would be, I would lose a part of my soul if I like looked the other way almost. I was gonna say, I think it's a thing that has, that started at least for me is like the moment I developed empathy. It was always like, I had to look around and understand that so many people were suffering where they didn't have to be. And, and what kind of person would I be if I didn't try and do something about that? And now that I've come to UVM and I look around and I see all of us united in the same struggle, facing, with, facing the same problems, um, I think it's only natural that like I'm, I'm disgruntled and I'm prepared to do something about it. Yeah, and college as well is like one of the first times that a lot of people get the chance to do something. So like a lot of us have done other activism stuff before, but a lot of people haven't because there hasn't been something in their area. There hasn't been something they've been comfortable getting involved with. Um, and so union students, mutual aid, gadfly now kind of provides an opportunity to do something and then see the results of that something instead of just, you know, signing another petition and then waiting 10 years for something. We can actually change something. Also, it's easier to believe when we can when we have won before mm -hmm. and we've Sears Lane was not a total win, but we were able to keep an encampment open and keep people how keep people able to be live in their own homes for or the makeshift homes they built for months. We were able to we won with a staff union contract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we camped out for a week. We fought like we fought really hard and we won. And sometimes winning can look differently. Like with even the petition that we made, I think my first semester on campus, um, like it got the attention of Res Life and it got the attention of people like higher up um, in the admin. And sometimes that visibility and um, and them feeling threatened almost does feel like a win because we are we're doing something that they're scared about. Great yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I can't go out with that one. I don't know what to say after that. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Well, it's good to recognize successes as you have them along the way and must also be difficult because you're in, you know, you're balancing study, life, maybe work, um, meeting new people, traversing new environments, growing with this attempt, this work to change the world. Um, so. What are some of the things that you're focusing on? What are the issues that you're focusing on at campus, but also in the stories that you're going to write at the Gadfly or have been writing? Um, I co-founded Students Against Institutional Violence with Sid Parton um, the beginning of last semester, but it was like a thing in the works, and we finally like named um, the organization. It's an informal group. We're not recognized. We don't plan to be recognized. But this is our called students against, against institutional, institutional violence, violence save, save UVM, and um, we, our mission is to um, eradicate Greek life and um, existing forms of violence on campus. Um, th these violences being white supremacy, um, Patri patriarchy, racism sexism, um, ableism, rape culture, and the list goes on. And UVM loves to advertise um, itself as a non-Greek life school when, yeah, maybe the membership isn't as much compared to bigger schools out there, but it is definitely still relevant on campus. And it also define, it, it also depends on how you define um, how much um, an organization or institution is active on campus because it, because it pretty much is like they have or it very much is they have events 
every week they have they host parties every week where people get drugged and raped and assaulted and it and the admin love to pretend like nothing's going on which is crazy because they do know they're just afraid to admit it and to lose their money because if there wasn't violence in Greek life they wouldn't be hosting all of these panels and town halls and asking students to not go to unrecognized groups on campus. Um, there wouldn't be a sexual assault prevention com task force committee assigned to Greek life. So um, that's one of the issues that um, I um, speak about on campus. Um, Sid and I also carry our signs every day. Um, mine says, end the violence, and Sid says, UVM hid my rape. But um, yeah, radical visibility is our whole thing, and we plan to do much more in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And have you written about that? Has that been run, written about yet in the I'm, Gadfly I'm working on to it. look at it? Yeah, yeah. I'm working okay. on it. I do want to, like, um, I've been reading a lot of, like, feminist literature um, lately, and I want to make this perfect. I don't want to just talk. Because we've had, we've distributed literature, we've distributed these pamphlets, and we've talk about, talked about it. And it's not like people don't know that Greek life sucks. Like, this is pretty common knowledge. But I, I do want to, like, go into depth about um, the, har the actual harms and how they aid people even past graduation, like the networks and like, and the political affiliation of members. And um, there, it's a huge rabbit hole, but um, it, 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 like the effects of Greek life surpass um, university life for sure. I also want to say Empowering Survivors published a really powerful and beautiful piece which isn't directly about green, Greek life but it's about the broader pattern of, how, of UVM in action on sexual assault and preventing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, that's um, in issue two of The Gadfly. Um, Empowering Survivors is an anonymous Instagram account run by members who are also anonymous and <laughs> hence the anonymous Instagram account. Okay. Um, and it was started in 2021 when um, I guess um, I want to say the first big protest against sexual assault um, on campus happened um, in May of 2021. I wasn't on campus then but I did um, watch the UVM US <laughs> Instagram live stream which is how I found out about UVM US and um, sexual assault the, the prevalence of sexual assault on campus. And yeah, so they started um, an account and they post anonymous um, stories of mem from members of the community and mostly UVM students. Um, and it's really depressing to look at. And, but, but it's so powerful, I think, to give students the ability to share their story anonymously without any reper repercussions or having to go through like the brutal process of like Title IX and like reporting and all of that. Um, it gives students an alternative to all of that. Like you don't necessarily like, or like it gives control yeah. over survivors' stories. So I do want to ask about um, why you're using paper zines mm -hmm. newspapers to talk about issues because you bring up the inst you know you bring up instagram and we're in a community we're in a culture of media true but i also want to give a chance if there are other issues that you want to talk about and then also how these issues interface with one another yeah. like how i mean you mentioned a lot of you know patriarchy racism sexism rape culture how are you seeing that? How the, how these issues interact with each other? So we see a lot of different issues really intersect with each other in a lot of different ways, and we can identify these things, and we learn about them in our classes, and that's a big, huh. you know, thing that is discussed now is how like, oh, uh, environmental justice is like a class that's taught and is becomes like very core to a lot of stuff we study, where it's like racism 
and pollution go hand in hand in that a neighborhood that is predominantly black is going to be polluted at like I think six times the rate than a white neighborhood even if they're at the same income level so it's not just about class but it's also about race and we can see all these different intersections in our daily lives um, to the paper comment we have like Instagrams for the groups that we were in before and you know we'll post on Instagram but end of the day the only people who are really gonna see the Instagram stories we make are people who are following our account and look at it semi-regularly and even then the algorithms of Instagram or I think in the past groups have used like Facebook or any number of these things the algorithms are only going to show them to like a very specific percent of people hmm. on our page so a lot of the work that we have to do is going to be word of mouth or putting up flyers places and even then those are generally for like a specific event which means that we have to have like a specific thing at a specific time that we have to try and get as many people to come down to mm -hmm. or we have to like host a bunch of events at a bunch of different times to like do outreach and stuff and if we're running a newspaper I think it makes it a lot easier to get people involved because they can come to any meeting at any time and learn about what they can do to get involved but also learn about how they can support us on a project if they just want to you know put in some work on something so we cover a lot of different issues around town we work with uh, I know some of us individually have worked with migrant justice in the past doing yeah, we got a migrant justice sweatshirt right here and we love all the work they do and we help out at protests and we do phone banking and any number of things and we love helping out with them and then generally just supporting different protest movements and unions around town is work we've also done in the past but for the newspaper specifically we want to be like both spreading the word about things that are happening around town but also talking about you know national issues international issues and also just doing like fun creative things because you know you spend long enough time in an activist space specifically on like one or two campaigns you burn out pretty mm -hmm. fast and things can be really draining so we've all burned out we've all burned out and we've gotten less burnt out but that doesn't really go away so having a space where you can be creative and sort of regenerate yourself a bit has been very nice Same to yours. Uh, I was gonna say, to um, beyond just like the the topics of like um, like sexual assault or like uh, racism sexism patriarchy on campus um, part of what we also cover in the gadfly is like any sort of like artistic expression um, that we think is like meaningful or important which is why um, we've in already included like a lot of poetry a lot of art and such um, which sometimes people would not have another route to publish with um, and we can we can like platform the creations of people in our own community um, which I think is is one of the most important things we can do as just a group of people who publish any media yeah. it's it's fun to put pen to paper. Also, like it helps with archiving. Um, it's hard to keep track of what gets put online um, when it comes to like archiving stuff. Um, like special collections at UVM is trying to navigate that. But I'm also kind of old school. I think we're all kind of old school. I do enjoy newspapers and printed versions of things. Um, and. Yeah, I guess th that's a pretty simple explanation, but everything else that Max said also matters. One. Um. Uh, also, our, I think some of this sort of comes out of like zine culture, which is something that was big when I was growing up, and I think still is now, but and was before I grew up 90s. too. But it's a, yeah, 90s too. But like they still people still make yeah. and print zines, and they're very personal a lot of the time. But also, like I would much rather have like a little, you know, zine that I could hold and show my friends and make copies of easily rather than like an Instagram slideshow which I would have to pull up on my phone or text to a friend. So yeah, I like a physical a copy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We also have fun, we also yeah. throw, it, something that's really hard to do on a website or an Instagram is fun little games. We, we try and throw in a word search or a crossword in Every single issue, I think we've done. Yeah. And bingo. I, bingo, yes. <laughs> the 420 zine. 420 zine, special edition. A mini, a mini one pager zine. Yeah. It's more like interactive, it's more tactile, it's yeah. like more intimate, I think, to have something in paper, physical, and that, that helps, like, you know, portray our message better. It used to be, uh, there used to be a contest that if you um, found the most typos, 
and yeah. they were accurate, you'd get a couple of pints of ice cream. You should do that. Mm. <laughs> Where? Like, well, back in the day, it used to be from it used to be seconds from Ben and Jerry's because oh. you could go in and yeah. buy seconds. But um, we should. You know, you could, we should we found that. a couple typos. We definitely that. messed up. <laughs> and then people have to read. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Hey, that's true. You have to look for the typos. Mm. We'll, we'll do that. Do. Mm. Um, that's a good idea. So, really good you know, you mentioned like learning about things, you know, mm -hmm. in your classes about social justice. And I, you know, it makes me think about the race and culture class, which I think is called something else now. I've What's it called? It. Um, so, it could be a number of things because now it, we're, it's called diversity requirements. Uh -huh. So, race and racism falls within D1 and everything else kind of non European stuff. Yeah. And you know the origin of these classes, right? Yes, yes. I do. Yeah, talk up a little bit oh about my God. that. Um, so, like going back to successful movements, um, I um, so the protesters, um, the Waterman takeover protesters in '88 and '91 talked a lot about existing racism, and um, I was actually watching an old video. Um, where they're like sitting on the ground. I think this might have been 91. They're sitting on the ground uh, somewhere and talking about like, I think this was post takeover. And they said that this isn't a diversity issue. This is an anti-racism issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how we should frame it. Like, I don't think, I think it's a little um, messed up to call these requirements, diversity requirements as if they like, or a checklist as if like diversity needs to be like you you check off a box and you've achieved diversity yeah. um sarah emma talks a lot about that and the role of diversity or like diversity work in institutions but um going back to the um movement that caused it or like or led to these requirements obviously like i think having these having classes that do talk about race and racism um, should be happening and they weren't and I'm glad that um, they were able to bring that tangible change to campus. Um, I think the office of DEI um, is working or I think has like finalized a new version of um, diversity requirements on campus and I think they're going to be set in place in a few years. Um, but. Yeah, that was um, I, also um, what is now known as the Mosaic Center on campus, I think is also a direct um, result of the protest that happened. I think it was called the Center for Cultural Plurality. Pluralism, yeah. Pluralism yeah. That for many, many years. And it is now called the Mosaic Center. And the Mosaic Center has given me such a safe space on campus. Like it means so much to me and it's so much to a lot of my friends. And it's, it's honestly like due to those protesters and the activism that happened in 81 and 91 and I don't think people realize that enough. Mm -hmm. Also isn't it where you and Sam met? We met, we, we, meet, we met at the Mosaic Kitchen. Um, I'm not always there. It's actually my least favorite spot for other. The kitchen? But the yeah. kitchen. I, but um, someone introduced us to each other and I was like, and that's how Sam got involved yeah. with mutual nice. aid, UVM US. So Sam wouldn't be here. Yeah. <laughs> if not for you. If not yeah. for the 91 takeover. <laughs> yeah. That's great. But, Sam, were you gonna say something more about that? Yeah, I was gonna say actually, um, going back to like um, the idea of like the D1 classes as just being something that the university like slapped the word diversity on and went with it. Um, it seems like the way that these are taught and, and the manner in which they're required um, is is pandering heavily to mm -hmm. what's very well known, like UVM's predominantly incredibly white campus, um, to where they're they're just kind of giving like the, their their mass of white students like a little cop out card of you took you know a diversity course, therefore we've taught you to be anti racist, mm -hmm. um, and they just run with that even though. Realistically, there's there's no actual action being done. There's nothing that can that is really being done to teach these people to be anti-racist. They can just like sit through the class, and as long as they take the credits, the university assumes that they've unlearned what what they've had to unlearn. And to add on 
add to that, I don't think because, and I'm in cast, so I do have a little more exposure to, um, I guess, um, the arts uh, and social sciences, which do tend to be very white. Um, but a lot for m different colleges, these are the only two like social science classes they kind of have to take, and they're done. And I think my issue with that is that I think we should have these elements exist in every class and not have that be like a separate like special class where students are like yeah i i learned about diversity i learned about racism today yeah so it sounds like it sounds like because we're getting to a time place where we're gonna we're gonna i it sounds like we could do a number of shows yeah. mm -hmm. it sounds like gadfly could have their own gadfly tv mm -hmm. to describe you know to to level criticisms and suggestions and growth opportunities for what's happening at UVM for changes that could be implemented. I did want to take a minute to bring up the archival footage that you looked at because you were talking about. Um, so I have here, and we'll see if we can see it on the screen here. Uh, I just searched under the term Waterman because that was, um, and so I'm wondering if anything begins to look the go. UVM student takeover, UVM arrests and removals. Oh, epic. <laughs> no names for justice sit in at UVM from 2018, which is interesting. Yeah. It's UVM student takeover, three, three days, days visiting the office in 1991. Is there any, are there any of these clips? And then there are clips that you'll see um, this UVM minority titles and news clippings from 1988. There's, there's, there's um, are, yeah. That are there, they're in our archives, they just haven't been digitized yet. So is there one of these that you wanted to take a look at? Um, or have or recommend? Definitely the 88 documentary. Um, it's also on YouTube too. Um, I don't remember how I discovered it. I think I accidentally came, uh, discovered CCTV because I was like Googling all these things and I saw your archive collection and I think that's when I like truly became obsessed um, and started learning about campus history but um, that I'm take a look at this I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this up because it's a little meta because this is UVM student takeover of Waterman building uh, oh oh my god this one I showed my friends this it was it looks so 90s and it's <laughs> and it's in our art it's in the studio here oh it's in the studio here but when our studio was on the other side of the building oh my god um, so let's moment. take a look afternoon it's 5 45 and we are on live on channel 17 I am Lauren Glenn Davidian here for the next half hour, we are visiting with some of the students who occupied the president's office at the University of Vermont, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and I'm also going to tell our viewers that you can call us at 862-3966 if you have any questions or comments. We love your phone calls. The phone number is here on our desk so since is, our character generator just died, so you're studios. going to have to remember that number, 862-3966, and I will repeat it often. <laughs> and there's a siren. So why don't we just start by you all introducing yourselves? I don't know if we can see you My name is Lynn Pono. My name is Krista Schott as well. My name is Dave Kim. Now, can you talk a little bit about why you occupied the president's office? What was the process? Who your group of people are? Just a little bit of the background about what happened and why. Um, basically, we were just a um, bunch of concerned students for the past couple years, um, this thing that we did was um, an action that we thought was necessary, looking at what the university was doing for people of color on the campus um, of U UVM, which was basically nothing for the past three years since the last Mormon takeover, when they promised these broad range um, changes called water agreements, which, uh, which is totally marginalized, and they did not do anything really basically for students of color on campus for the past three years except for lie and give them the runaround in the administrative process. Yeah. So what was Still part of the that. Waterman agreement that was reached three years ago? What were some of the conditions? Uh, some of them were 
You're gonna have to really speak up into the mic. Hold the mic close to you. Um, some of so it's them important were, to note are dealt with um, the, an increase in the number of faculty the lower of color third down and here. Number of students I think color. it's important to note that and, these are um, students that better were like outreach and um, recruiting to um, people of color to come to the university. Um, these are students that had been in the president's office mm -hmm. now for. Um, I can't even remember. It's like 30, 20 days. Yeah, 20, 30, 30 days. days. And they had just all been arrested in a pretty dramatic arrest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've seen the video um, of that too. And they had taken over the student's office, and you'll learn some of that through this, is they'd taken over the student's office, the president's office, after probably months and months, and for some folks, years of different kinds of negotiation to try to actually affect change around a series of points. Mm -hmm. um, that were were pretty agreed upon by the community, and the whole event. So, basically, what was your argument? You, what, you weren't satisfied with that. Was the whole event was like a, was a was a learning experience for the entire campus? Yeah. Did you learn? Did you did you catch some of that in your when you were re reviewing the the footage? What did you get from reviewing this footage? I'm curious. Um, I was, first of all, s s I mean, shook that they were even able to do that. I mean, we spent, I guess, a week in the tents, and that destroyed us. But to spend 20 days, I think it was 22 almost. I think it, it got it up till 22. I could be wrong. Um, in the president's row, um, demanding that they um, listen to your demands and um, and I think I think I learned a lot from that I've learned um, well I learned that UVM hasn't really done a lot since but but it's definitely impacted the few people of color that still do exist on campus. It isn't, it's still, I think at that time, it was 2% of campus, and now it's gone up to like roughly 11, 12%, um, which well, is- like, Students of color now uh, are constitute 12% of the UVM, yep. yeah. which is mm -hmm. interesting. Well, I mean, definitely an increase from 2%, but uh, um, yeah, uh, I think there's less than 100 black students on campus. Yeah. Um, it's it still sucks. Like I didn't have, Wait, oops, I didn't. Sorry, yeah, I sorry didn't have a per person of color. I didn't have a professor of color teach me until last semester, and he was the first faculty of color in the political science department. Um, I've heard many black s students talk to me about how they've never had a black professor teach them in their respective colleges. Hmm. Um, I don't see representation really anywhere. Like I walk into a room and I immediately notice that like it's just filled with white a lot people. of white circles and white circles that have the privilege to not be affected by um, the issues on campus um, related to racism. A couple things I've learned from it is that uh, they're willing to publish the names and addresses of student activists, which Burlington is... Burlington Free Press. Yeah, the Burlington Free Press did that at the time. Um, and just the amount of pushback that they had to students, and also that nothing really changed in the way that the university handles their response to requests for change. Um, I mean, they'll still pass the occasional bill and they set up negotiations and they'll ask students for their commentary or for us to plan an entire you know plan for them to do like what they have a something called the sustainable campus fund for climate things but end of the day when you finally do get them to commit to something they'll either weasel out of it and avoid doing it or they will you know, say they'll do it for a year and then roll it back, like we see with divestment. They committed to divestment. It's got to be three years ago now. I haven't heard fossil, anything. Fossil yeah. fuel divestment. Yeah, fossil, fossil fuel, fuel divestment, divestment which yeah. is There's different from the uh, South African divestment. I think that's finished yeah. by now. That's but, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, no, but the fossil fuel divestment, they committed to doing so. It's got to be three years ago now. They, 2020 summer. Yeah, 2020 summer. They wrote it, you know, they signed, like, contracts and agreements and stuff. 
and they were supposed to deliver progress updates, and they haven't. And they won't respond to you know requests for accountability. And frankly, I think they know that. Also, another thing I noticed is that this group had pretty well set up like networks of support and a lot of students willing to do occupations. And at this point, occupations are really intense and the responses from the university have gotten more intense over the years because they've faced these encampments and occupations in the past that now they, every single year, I don't know if it's just me that gets emailed this, but I, I get an email every year that says you're not allowed to you know, build temporary structures on university greens or erect a temporary structure, which is like a tent. Or technically you're not allowed to hammock, yeah. but people still hammock. Weird, they gonna, don't care about that, they, they care about us. Yeah, because yeah. the point is it's, you know, That's something they can refer yeah, yeah. to to stop people from protesting. I yeah. also want I think to, the, yeah, go ahead, just quickly, uh, in tw on that note, in 2018, uh, there was the No Names for Justice Movement, and we scrolled past it quickly, a clip from it, when they did a small waterman takeover and some people used megaphones in there, and UVM tried to ruin those people's lives. Okay. UVM tried as desperately, the administration tried desperately and as hard as it could to expel these students to mess up their lives as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And the only reason they didn't, they didn't fully do that, is because of student pushback. Mm -hmm. um, I was gonna speak to what Max said about um, university responses, and I think that's what, um, that's a major reason why 91 happened is, um, I'm, I'm gonna quote Sarah Emmett again, but um, documents become um, a method of institutional performance where the institutions do the documents instead of doing the doing. Mm -hmm. And I think they, that's what they saw. Like the first president um, signed the agreement and then like left and then um, nothing really ever came of that. And then they got a new president and was like, nope, I'm not doing that. and. I guess they essentially had to restart the whole process over again. And um, I mean, the university loves to make committees to act like they're doing something about an issue, but these committees are very reserved. You have to apply to them. They know, they, they very much do know the students that like uh -huh. speak out like openly and are visible about these issues, but they would rather have them apply to these positions that shouldn't need Mm -hmm. like any application process like these issues affect everyone why are we making these like elite honorary committees to address something so severe on campus mm -hmm. and then the very activists get rejected and it's almost like I've d I've been rejected from committees and it almost like I think it's almost my stupidity for like thinking oh. that they're like gonna change and like it's really stupid like nothing actually ever comes um, from these committees when... I think that's interesting, the, the mm -hmm. idea that um, documents become a performance and mm -hmm. the documents become the doing rather than the, than the actual doing. And I think, yeah. I think, as I said, we have more to talk about, about the actual doing, and I welcome you all to come back. That'd I wanted awesome. to bring that up yeah. specifically to show you how these students back then got invited it was one of the first times I had learned, because um, I was a student at that time. These are all folks that I went to school with. I was one of the students outside who helped build Diversity University, and it was one of, I was like, oh, mm -hmm. here's this place um, where folks can uh, make their own media. So yay for you to grab um, literally the pen and the mic and make your own media in the form of the newspaper. You didn't talk about the kind of pushback you're getting or the reception or your work to become recognized by the student government, but it's been great to hear from you all here today. Mm -hmm. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time to thank share. So, thank you so much for having us. Thank, thank you so much for support. inviting yeah. us. Fun. And thank you all for watching. It's been great um, to be here together. We'll do, yeah, <laughs> we'll have us all on the set. And um, if you want to see more, media like this. Um, keep watching Town Meeting Television. Um, we are on 1087 Comcast. We are on Channel 17 and 217 Burlington Telecom. And um, you can also watch us on YouTube at YouTube backslash Town Meeting TV. Um, and if you want to make your own TV, uh, please join us. The studio is open to you, your organization, your community. Thanks and good night.